Oh, gosh. And now that's making me think of something that's been on my mind lately, and I don't know why. Um, I think I must have just come across a bunch of random videos through just browsing the recommended videos that are that sometimes pop up for me. Sometimes I get Family Guy clips, and I have no idea why. Because I don't watch Family Guy. I did at some point ages ago, but not anymore. And Wolf Link just falls flat on his face for no reason. But, uh, somehow I was led to this video on what are the worst episodes of The Simpsons. And I don't think I recognized most of them. But one of them that I did recognize was whatever one that is where Homer feels really down on his luck one day, and he hears this country girl singer at, um, at Moe's Bar, and, uh, whatever song that she sings he feels really empowered by, and it changes his life, and then she he wants him to, uh, ugh, getting pronouns just estranged. Um, he really wants her to become famous so that more people can hear her music, and so he manages to get her deals and, like, make her really famous. Also gotta love this day and night sequence. Let's just, let's just take a moment to appreciate it. He has fixed Qbert. But yeah, the... Homer gets uh, this country girl her notoriety that she deserves, and then she, like, asks him to s sleep with her in private. Well, like, obviously the sleeping would occur in private, but I mean she asks that in private. And, uh... Homer is tempted to do this, but then he says, Oh, you know what? No, I shouldn't actually do this. I, I have a wife. You know, I only wanted to get you famous, so you go ahead and stay famous and I'm just gonna leave. And she's like, okay. And then she writes a song about it. And Marge hears it, and she's, like, angry that Homer almost slept with her, uh, with her, but then she's like, oh, but you didn't, so that's cool. I'm just not gonna really acknowledge this any, fur uh, any further than that. I wasn't offended by this episode or anything. I don't remember it being offensively bad. But it is a really strange episode. Just because... The whole, like, having sex with this stranger, like, that's just kind of underplayed. Just sort of tucked in at the end. No idea. No idea why I even talked about this. Um, you might have noticed that I decidedly did not enter the cannon to go to the city in the sky. And that is because I have something stupid that I want to show off, although it's not that stupid, it's actually kind of useful. In the meantime, I'm just gonna try to find some, uh, some golden bugs to maybe bring to Agatha and spend some more money on Mallow Mart because I would rather go into the city in the sky with no rupees or very few rupees, because you always get tons of rupees in dungeons. Side questing stuff is fun. The main thing that I want to show off, though, is that there's this magical thing that happens when you launch into the city in the sky that I never really paid any attention to any other time that I've played this game. Um, whenever you go to the city in the sky, it doesn't matter if it's day or night, it will always be daytime in that temple. So you can just launch from that cannon at midnight when the moon is overhead, and then three seconds later it will be day. Just broad daylight, everything is super bright. Which I find fascinating. And a bit silly, but... You know, since this game doesn't have a, uh... A day-night cycle song like Wind Waker and Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask do, it's useful to have something that you can fall back on for changing it to daytime, and then there's something else later where you can change it to nighttime pretty quickly. Still not the most convenient system, but hey, if you're looking for pose, it's nice to have something. Or if you're just waiting for shops to open and it's nighttime, then that's... yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna cut out this part, because I spend a lot of time doing a big load of nothing here. Yeah, that part of the footage that I just cut out was a whole lot of waiting 
on these flying uh, vine things to hook shot onto or claw shot onto. And little else. I think there I got some arrows or something. But yeah, there's the dayfly. Saw it for a brief moment there. It's called the dayfly, but I'm pretty sure you can find it at night. And it's actually easier to find at night because it's, it all these golden blug, uh, blugs glow. Just call, they're just called blugs. That could be the uh, s jumbled abbreviation for um, ladybug, which is the next thing that we're going to find. Except instead of an L bug, it's a, a B L UG. Sure. I, I speak intelligible thoughts. Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. I really want to watch A Bug's Life again. That's a movie that I have not seen in ages, and the last thing that I remember about it was one of my brothers saying that uh, it's one of Pixar's weakest movies, which I can kind of see because it's just a movie about bugs, and there's kind of this underlying war tone to it, and that's... Oh yeah, what is that guy doing? That guy's just kind of strange. Just peering over people's shoulders, trying to analyze their every skin polygon. My father cannot get any hot spring water. <laughs> That's his voice, apparently. And that is another person who looks like whoever it is from Skyward Sword. I want to say his name starts with a C. It's like Ka. Ka. Maybe it's Ka Lin. Is that it? Terrible name. Well, I say terrible name, but I would probably name something very similarly if I had to come up with a whole bunch of villagers in Sky. Alright, cutting a bunch of that out because it took me way too freaking long to find this bug. It's just right here in plain sight. Um, I guess it's appropriate to be talking about a bug's life while talk while looking for bugs and having it take a lifetime. Um, yeah, I just want to see that movie again because the main thing that I personally remember about that movie is always getting really emotional from the ending. Like, more so than most Pixar movies. Because I definitely remember Up making me feel really emotional towards the start, but especially towards the end, the first time I saw it. And, uh, I would imagine that seeing Toy Story 3 again, the ending would make me emotional. And But A Bug's Life, for some reason, every time I see that ending, it gets me. Which, I don't see it very often, and that could be part of the reason that it gets me, but... Something about a story where there's a character who's not very well-liked, and having him prove his worth and have everyone, like, acknowledge him and think he's great in the end, that kind of story is just always really cool to me, and I love it, and... I feel like in A Bug's Life it's especially powerful, and I want to just see that again. It's a good movie. Observing those bottles. Look at the bottles in this place. Why can't I use one of these bottles? I'm sure I could fit like 600 fairies in there. I want to take your colorful tail and... Did she say tie it on a bow? I think that might have been what she said. What does she say about the next one? Sorry, I didn't mean to not give you that bug. Just like Flathead Screwdriver can smell evil, she can smell bugs. Of course, for her that makes more sense because bugs aren't an abstract concept. Except in the case of programming, maybe. I wonder how many bugs would actually fit in one of those glasses. I was trying to think of a Futurama quote, but I don't know the actual full quote. It's whatever one involves uh, the the robot college, and Bender goes to the college, and he uh, 
They say cheese it a lot. And he sees the nerds and they're like, Bender, you're the one who fit uh, 20 whole human beings into a phone booth. And he's like, ah, most of them are children. I think it's a good line. And also there's that episode where Bender adopts a bunch of kids and uh, he, what was it? He says, every other day, it's food, food, food. That's another good one. Futurama, another thing that I should probably see again sometime. Because I remember really enjoying Futurama, and it doesn't have... Well, it does have this overall story arc that is kind of... Only certain episodes, I guess, really make it move forward in a significant way, I guess, but... All in all, it's just a bunch of random episodes that don't really have... They, they all have their own standalone thing going. And people talk about Jurassic Bark being the saddest episode, which I don't think it is. I think it's a sad episode, sure, because, you know, dogs are more emotionally attachable to people than actual people are. And, uh... For, for some reason... I guess, I mean, I can't really blame people, because dogs are, dogs are cute and innocent, and, uh... You know, that you can't really say anything bad about a dog. They don't intentionally harm anyone, they're just dogs. So that makes them lovable in their own right, but... I think the saddest episode to me was, uh, what was it? The one with a lot of leaping forward in time. Where every so often it would just... Time itself would leap forward randomly an unknown amount of time. And that time would keep getting longer and longer, I think. So eventually it gets to a point where they say things like, Okay, in order to make this work, we need all the money in the world. And then it just flashes and it's President Nixon giving them all the money in the world. But the end of that one is really sad. So now I think we are ready to go to the City in the Sky. Now that it is not pitch black outside, but as close as this game gets. It's very dark blue. I want to know what would happen with this cutscene and the following scenes if you'd never met Uku before this point. Because I'm sure it's possible. Well, come to think of it, it would also be possible with the Temple, in, uh, Temple of Time. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what the dialogue in this temple would be if you never met Uku, is what I'm really saying here. And it's just daylight. This is probably the brightest area in the game. Just all of a sudden. It's like staying in a dark room when, whenever you're sleeping and then you open the door and then just the light is shining in your face. It's that kind of feeling. Oh, hey, look, it's Ridley. With his perfectly motionless shadow over Fendrana Drifts. So many Ukus. So many Uku noises. <laughs> They're like Ewoks. Yeah, okay, there's a dragon outside. Yeah, who is dragon? Dragon, 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 smagen, smagen, smogen, hogan. Toblerone. So yeah, I think we will cover all this another time, because I'm going to go to bed. So, I will see you for more City in the Sky.